Our regular coverage of uh, the Israeli offensive on Gaza continues on People's Dispatch with articles as well as updates uh, on the website, on our social media, uh, and on our YouTube as well. Uh, but on Daily Debrief today, we're focus uh, shifting focus to different parts of the world in light of a special uh, on Gaza that is uh, going to be on our YouTube uh, channel with uh, Zoe Alexandra as well as historian and writer Vijay Prashad. Uh, so our top story today, in fact, is a much overdue focus on the surprise performance of Sergio Massa in the Argentine uh, primary, the ruling party candidate, who's also the economy minister, uh, has uh, led us to the uh, brink of a runoff. Why is this a bit of a relief for those opposed to far-right uh, rule in Argentina? And what lies between now and the runoff on November 19th? Uh, also, primary healthcare is in focus at a WHO international conference celebrating uh, or commemorating the 45th anniversary of the Almata, as it was known then, uh, declaration on primary healthcare. Uh, we'll find out what's happening on that front. It's a subject we've covered um, in several uh, sort of aspects on Daily Deep Deep before, and, and we look at it uh, in the context of what's happening in the world today, particularly what's going on in Gaza. Uh, as well. Uh, Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief, as always, brought to you by People's Dispatch. Before we get into the rest of the show, take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, good to be back on Daily Debrief and, and joining us first up is Zoe Alexandra who has been actually uh, in line waiting for a while to talk about what's uh, been going on in Argentina after uh, the primary. We've of course uh, been focused mostly on the Israeli offensive on Gaza since the 7th of October uh, and Zoe is uh, uh, co-hosting a show later on, uh, on People's Dispatch with uh, Vijay Prashad. Uh, Zoe, before we get into Argentina and the details of that quite complex story as well. Um, give us a sense of what to expect from uh, that conversation that you're going to have with Vijay. Yeah, so we'll be uh, doing a short live show to just give a basic update on not only what's been happening uh, in Gaza uh, with regards to the airstrikes, but also I think the very, very uh, maybe difficult to untangle response of the international community. We've seen a lot of rebuttals between, for example, uh, UN officials and Israeli government officials. Uh, we've seen them go after Antonio Guterres, even Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist. So I think breaking down kind of what is what has been taking place in the past couple of days in terms of the international stage, uh, what has the U.S. position been, uh, and also, of course, what has been uh, the response of organized people on the streets across the world as they intensify their efforts uh, to stand in solidarity with Palestine. Um, and, and, and also what's been happening in the rest of uh, occupied Palestine. For example, yesterday there was an air raid in Janine. So we'll be covering all of that and more uh, to give people kind of this necessary fact-based, uh, but also left perspective on the events, because as we've seen, uh, mainstream media, not only in the global north, but really across the world has been taking uh, a very concerning approach to the events uh, and and this approach has actually cost lives. So it's really important at this time that um, analysis that is true to the facts and that also understands the historical context of what's happening in Gaza today uh, be be presented. It continues to uh, cost lives, Zoe, as we speak. Uh, in fact, and in that sense, and that's why so much of our focus also, I guess, has been on. Uh, covering events as they have unfolded from a left perspective. Uh, but we do have to move on to Argentina and talk about that story as well, because because, because it is extremely important. Uh, as you've told us before on the show, the people of Argentina have been through all kinds of uh, tough times uh, over the past few years with over 100% inflation and all of that. Uh, and then the emergence of this outrageous candidate uh, for for the top job you know, and, and the kind of suggestions of, of sort of all out removing uh, the currency and replacing it with the dollar, where those dollars will come from, who knows. But uh, but uh, 
but but Zoe, tell us what's been happening and and how surprised are you pleasantly or otherwise uh, to see how Sergio Massa has done in the primary. Well, it's definitely been a turbulent couple of months in Argentina. As we reported on this show and on People's Dispatch, uh, in August, the primary elections took place in Argentina, which are essentially not binding, but are serve as a tool to kind of elect who will run in the uh, different coalitions. So the progressive Feronista coalition uh, to, united for the homeland. Uh, and then the right, not even going to say center right, because it actually is a right wing coalition, uh, co coalition together for change. This is the Macrista tendency. Uh, and then uh, also Javier Millet with his Liberty Advances, which is the far right um, libertarian party. And so it, it, it serves not only for these coalitions to decide who's going to run for them, but also as a litmus test in terms of how each one of them is performing. Uh, and in this primary election uh, in August, Javier Millet had a surprising victory. Um, he led the vote toll uh, with around 30%. And this sent a shockwave in Argentine society. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Sinanth, he, he proposes uh, dollarization, which again, where are those dollars going to come from? And the horrific impact this would have on so many levels of the Argentine economy, most of all, of course, impacting uh, the working class and poor in Argentina, which today stands at about 40% of the population. Um, as you said, in the last year, Argentina had over 100% inflation. The economy is in shambles. And someone like Javier Millet, who not only proposes uh, dollarization, but also an intensification of austerity measures, which has already caused uh, so much suffering in the country, um, an increase in hunger, again, an increase in unemployment, uh, the growth of the informal sector, a lack of formal jobs, which actually have job security and benefits. Um, so, you know, Argentina is already in a crisis and the threat of someone like Javier Millet was a serious shock uh, in addition to all of his kind of social conservative policies against abortion, against gay people, you know, all sorts of ridiculous and horrendous things. Um, and since then, since August, since this primary elections, there's been a considerable effort from the Peronista center-left coalition uh, to mobilize. Uh, Sergio Mas is the current uh, Minister of Finance and Economy in the country. And in his position, he's actually implemented several measures to alleviate economic stress of the working class um, and really trying to address the biggest issue on everyone's mind in Argentina, which again is the economy. Um, and this clearly, both the, the fear of a, a Millet presidency plus the measures to actually address these concerns have clearly had an impact. Uh, he had essentially a huge turnaround uh, and polled in first. He didn't receive enough votes to win outright in the first round of elections, but um, he is likely, uh, many pollsters are predicting that he could take the second round, given the fact that uh, the, the right-wing coalition Together for Change, which had as its candidate Patricia Bullrich, is now going to be in severe crisis because many people part of this, of this right-wing coalition do not want a uh, Javier Millet presidency. This would be extremely bad for business. This would be extremely bad for many economic elites in the country. And so now they're looking at uh, this coalition is likely going to fracture. It's going to divide. Many uh, key leaders are going to actually fall behind Sergio Massa. Uh, some will support Millet, but it's likely not going to be enough to actually bring him ahead and to get the votes he needs for this victory. There's been a lot of rumors on Twitter, a lot of rumors, uh, sorry, on X, and a lot of rumors on other kind of uh, amongst political commentators. I even heard someone say that he that Javier Millet might drop out before this race. I think that's unlikely, but really all is up for grabs right now. This is an extremely kind of politically volatile and ever-changing situation just due to the delicate nature of the economy of the ridiculousness of Millet's proposals, I think he's finding that maybe some of his statements were a little too bold uh, for what Argentina uh, was ready for. Oh, so, so give us a bit of context uh, and also analysis where you can, Zoe, of uh, the way in which the economy in Argentina has shaped up over the past few decades leading up to this point and how it's been structured by, uh, you know, international financial capital, uh, the IMF, and, 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 the, and, and, and 
and why this election then becomes all the more crucial for you know uh, to build on some of the social on the social front the victories that Argentinians have had uh, in the recent past. So one of the largest factors shaping um, the presidency of Alberto Fernandez was the IMF loan that was taken out uh, by Mauricio Macri during his presidency uh, from 2015 to 2019. Uh, Mauricio Macri inherited an Argentina that was uh, did not have significant foreign debt. This debt had been paid off by uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner during her presidency. Um, and during Mauricio Macri's uh, government, they took out a, a several billion dollar IMF loan extremely, extremely unpopular. Um, the IMF is the very institution that broke the Argentine economy in the early 2000s when we saw the mass uprising uh, on the streets and the complete crumbling of the Argentine peso. Um, and so once again, in 2018, the Argentine government takes out this huge IMF loan. There are massive protests on the streets. Uh, people are saying never again IMF. They know the damage that this caused the economy, but nevertheless, uh, Mauricio Macri went ahead with this, and unsurprisingly, um, this did not actually have any uh, alleviation on the working class um, economic difficulties. Uh, this only saw an increase um, in misery. Uh, the poverty rate under Mauricio Macri skyrocketed again to this figure, which is at today, which is over 40% of the population uh, in a state of poverty, living under the poverty line, um, levels of food insecurity and hunger, again, also increasing the number of people in a state of homelessness. So all of these social economic indicators uh, rose while uh, Mauricio Macri was allegedly taking out this IMF to save the economy. Um, when Alberto Fernandez took office in December 2019, the demand from a lot of social movements and organized sectors was that he not pay this IMF loan. Um, for many of them, it was an illegal loan. It was a loan that was taken out uh, against uh, the demands and the desires of the people. Um, it is a loan that um, people have done investigation about actually where did this money go? And many uh, show that it was it went to um, uh, you know venture capital. Uh, they took it out of the country. This was not actually put into any social programs. In fact, under Mauricio Macri, social and economic uh, welfare programs were cut. Uh, they say mm. that it is not within the interest of the Argentine people to actually pay back this loan. Um, however, our Alberto Fernandez, under political pressure from this really broad Peronista coalition, which includes many right-wing sectors, and under feeling like he didn't have enough uh, maybe popular support on the streets to really push forward with this bold move, uh, did negotiate with the IMF. They started repaying the debt. And so this, the IMF loan is going to continue to be a, cent, to be a central issue. Um, and yeah. above all, as the left-wing candidate, Juan Graboy, who ran for the primary seat uh, of the uh, Together for the Homeland, Union for Homeland Coalition, he says that mm -hmm. the, the key and primary concern uh, for the center coalition, for movements in the country, is that Argentine people be guaranteed housing, be guaranteed work, uh, and be guaranteed land, and that uh, everything else, whether it's the payment of this illegal loan, as they say, um, or any other thing, is secondary. And that until that's addressed, until that's guaranteed, the Argentine people are still going to be in this state of economic insecurity, of food insecurity, and that uh, these are measures that have to be taken immediately. So we've seen that Massa did respond to this need to actually address the economic situation. He implemented these measures in this time he will probably have to continue that because just if just because Massa wins the elections does not mean that uh, the economy is magically going to get better and that the situation yeah. of people is going to get better. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Zoe, for that update. And uh, a reminder, once again, for those of you watching, uh, you can catch Zoe and Vijay Prashad on uh, People's Dispatch on a, doing a short special uh, on the situation in Gaza. Um, and uh, next up, we're talking about the WHO and primary healthcare. It's a subject, uh, like I was saying at the beginning of the show, we've addressed in uh, several regards or aspects uh, on Daily DB before, um, uh, in, including a few days ago with Anna, who joins us 
uh, again today. Uh, and now, if you can hear me, uh, this uh, conference celebrating 45 years of uh, the uh, Almaty or Almata, as it was then uh, called, a Declaration on Primary Healthcare. Um, a significant event bringing into focus an area of uh, a sector that needs so much conversation and so much work. Uh, yes. So, um, I mean, if we look at uh, how this conference was shaped and uh, if we look also at, uh, the, at the reasons why it was announced, uh, of course, we're talking about 45 years, uh, which is a big number, a pretty big number for, uh, for for a very important declaration that was supposed to change how primary health care works, uh, works uh, in the world. Uh, but they're also marking another anniversary, and that's five years of the Astana Declaration, which, uh, um, which was kind of brought in as, uh, we can call it informally, a refresher of uh, of the Alma uh, of the Alma at the declaration in 2018, and so um, you know uh, this conference is some it's somehow important because it um, it reminds us of the differences between these two declarations that uh, that have arisen during time, and so of course you know um, a primary healthcare comprehensive primary healthcare remains an immensely important part of uh, of the uh, of uh, the people's right to health. As the People's Health Movement, as many other left uh, uh, left health networks uh, repeat to point out, uh, there's it's difficult to imagine having any healthcare if we don't have primary healthcare, and so uh, a primary healthcare that is based uh, on public provision of services, of pu on public uh, on public funding of services, but also on a health workforce uh, which is there, uh, well employed, well paid, and can work in dignity. So those were also, uh, you know, key pillars of the Alma Ata Declaration, uh, but also including community participation and uh, what I think it's particularly important to single out these days, a new international economic order. Uh, those are some of the elements that we don't see at all or we see in very little trace in the Astana Declaration and in the documents that follow the Astana Declaration. So essentially what, you know, when the WHO and particularly WHO Europe does when it meets to discuss primary health care, uh, we have to acknowledge that their focus now and the terms in which they talk about primary health care now is very different to what we uh, we saw uh, in the original ALMAT declaration. Uh, it's a focus which has shifted uh, a long time ago towards universal health coverage, which uh, again, um, activists uh, and health uh, uh, so and public health uh, experts have warned uh, drives health systems towards commercialization, towards marketization, towards financialization. Essentially, uh, it brings in a completely different perspective of primary health care and how it should work than what it was supposed to be. So you know. Uh, when this conference is announced and when they say, oh, but we're going to talk about the practical aspects of primary health care in the light of COVID, uh, we're going to talk about lessons that we have learned. Uh, yeah. It's also about that uh, about the lessons that we have left behind, unfortunately, because what we had with the original Almata declaration uh, was something that was much more pow powerful and uh, could have done much, much more better, uh, much mm. more good to, to the world than uh, what essentially we're talking about today and maybe that will uh, perhaps come up as one of the learnings uh, yeah as you were pointing out uh, but uh, other than that uh, Anna on the agenda are uh, important uh, other issues as well that, that you were pointing out um, you alluded to the idea of workforce health workforces and we've spoken about this subject at length uh, on debrief of course um, as well as looking at migrants and refugees and, and uh, specific issues concerning primary health care when it comes to those uh, communities or those or that section of people. And, and now with uh, another few hundred of thousands added to the world's list of internally displaced or displaced people, uh, it's quite contextual as well. Yes, uh, and again, I think it plays an important role that we're seeing this international conference on primary healthcare uh, in parallel 
to the regional meeting of WHO Europe. Uh, so, mm. you know, it's uh, it's essentially, um, it's a European conversation uh, with, but we should allow ourselves the space to look at the membership of WHO Europe, uh, which consists of a very broad, you know, number of uh, number of states, including Israel, I believe, because uh, yes, so it's um, uh, Israel has been uh, among the uh, on the list of uh, of the members of the WHO Europe region for for quite a bit of time. Uh, that's okay. So that's not a key fact for this discussion, uh, but I think that the composition of the region uh, and therefore the discussions that take place are also indicative of the of the ways and of the approaches that uh, the uh, that then the policy and the documents uh, also take so you know it's um, when we talk about this kind of agenda that, that they have set up for themselves which yes of course includes uh, the health workforce uh, which was recognized uh, quite a bit, quite a quite a long time ago, uh, as the for, from the WHO as a key aspect of uh, securing primary healthcare and healthcare overall. Mm. Um, but then, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, since the European member states have been discussing about it a lot, and again, we have talked it uh, here as well, uh, mm. they somehow fail to grasp some of the the, the realities that are there on the ground. So. Uh, as with any WHO document, when you read it, uh, of course, it's uh, it, it, it's a decent set of ideas. So the, the documents that they have on the table do address very important things. So, you know, how do we train and retain people who are coming in the, uh, in the, health, uh, in the health system? Uh, you know, we should guarantee uh, decent salaries for everyone who's, uh, who's in, in, uh, in Europe's health system. But then on the other hand, we're not talking about, at least not critically, about the role of the private sector. So, you know, if yeah. you look at any of those documents, you will find references and quite strong and positive references to the role that the private sector plays. So it can be, uh, whether we're talking about education of health workers to provision of services. So mm -hmm. these are all things that in practice are highly problematical. Uh, they should be, um, they should be limited they should be controlled in a way. Uh, the WHO yeah. should, su should support member states to take an active approach to that, uh, particularly in Europe, because we know that Europe is taking very problematic approaches to, to how health, uh, public health systems are being shaped. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, thanks very much, Anna, for that update, and uh, ho hope to have you back on the show uh, very soon to, uh, to talk about, uh, yeah, like I've said, uh, an important area and a sector where a lot is going on, a lot of conversations are happening. So side by side, alongside, you know, uh, conflict that we see all over, whether it's in Europe itself or uh, in Gaza at the moment, uh, there are also important conversations happening on the subject of healthcare and, and people are sort of rallying around it. Uh, so from Anna, myself and the entire team at People's Dispatch, thank you very much for watching this episode of uh, Daily Debrief. For details on these stories, you can go to our website peoplesdispatch.org uh, and also don't forget to follow us on the social media platform that you use. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Thank you for watching.